first, we have uh, the Victorian Ombudsman, Ombudsperson, Ombud. Ombudsman. Ombudsman, that's a bold, bold statement. Uh, Deborah Glass. Uh, Deborah studied law at Monash University, and after a brief period of practice, she joined the US Investment Bank in Switzerland in 85. In 89, she was appointed to the Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission and became senior director. In 98, she became the chief executive of the Investment Management Regulatory Organization in London. 2001, she joined the UK Police Complaints Authority. 2004, became a commissioner with the new Independent Police Complaints Commission of England and Wales. 2012, she was made an officer of the uh, British Order of the British Empire, OBE. Uh, she holds, I'm told in my briefing notes, that Deborah holds a firm belief in public sector integrity and the protection of human rights, but it's not clear whether <clears throat> that belief is in these as matters of fact or these as matters of aspiration. In any event, I'm very delighted that she's here to speak and maybe she'll el elucidate that for us in the next little while. Thank you. Deborah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, accountability, engagement, activism, that's what we're here to talk about today. And I, I, I'm guessing that I am the accountability um, element in that particular triad. Uh, talking justice. Now, as you probably aware, the ombudsman, and it, it is in fact ombudsman, it's a Swedish word, it's uh, intended to be gender neutral, and I often get out if I'm an ombudswoman and I say that I am not, because it is in fact the, um, a term that applies to all people who occupy this role. It actually means defender of the people, which is rather a nice thing to be. And if I could spend a minute on the origin of ombudsman, right, why there is an ombudsman, it is actually because fundamentally of the imbalance of power between the individual and the state, which is an inherently unfair relationship. And as a Victorian ombudsman, I actually deal with complaints about over a thousand public sector bodies, all 79 local councils, which, as you're probably aware, is a fairly rich source of popular discontent. Um, but there, there is actually one agency that, um, that generates more complaints even than councils, even than parking fines and rubbish collection. So, um, so actually today, I'm, um, I'm not going to be talking justice. I'm going to be um, talking prisons. We dealt with about 3,000 complaints last year about our prison system. And that isn't only because there is a free call line to the Ombudsman's office in every single Victorian prison. Are you aware of that? Uh, that's only been in place since 2006, that free call line. And my office has actually been around since 1973. And the Ombudsman has been quite active in the prison's environment, actually, since starting in 73. And here, let me introduce you to the first ombudsman, Sir John Dillon. Uh, in his very first annual report, Sir John commented on the number of complaints he was getting from prisoners. He was getting about a third of his 1,334 complaints actually came from prisoners. That was 391 complaints he got. I get about 10 times that. And if you think actually that things in prisons are grim today, you actually should read some of his, his reports because he was describing in these reports uh, the experience of prison, prisoners in Pentridge's infamous H Division. Anybody remember H Division? Uh, they were required to smash rocks. Uh, they didn't have beds in some cases. And uh, he also uh, commented rather presciently that they had been deprived of the right to smoke. Now, times have changed. Uh, Pentridge, as you know, uh, not unlike we're coming in here this morning, actually seeing this old jail, you know, turn into this magnificent sort of theatre complex. You know, Pentridge is, uh, is becoming a luxury housing development in, um, in Melbourne. And let's not talk about the smoking ban. But, um, but if, if complaints are an indicator of pressure points in the system, uh, perhaps times haven't quite changed enough. And I'm um, just putting up here some of the uh, reports that the last ombudsman, the one before me, put up around the prison system. Uh, he did quite a few investigations into prisons issues and the most recent one before I took in the role was all about overcrowding in our prison system. Uh, and that was a situation when I came into the role in 2014. So I, when I came in, I 
was became aware very quickly that prisons were the number one source of complaints to my office. And a fairly typical complaint that we were getting were, were from prisoners who were unable to access programs that they needed to do to get parole. You know, no programs, no parole, so people were staying in prison longer. They weren't able to... Um, to, uh, to get onto these programs, and some of them were actually being released um, really at the end of their sentence without having done the programs at all. So, you know, which, which meant in the case of some of these violence intervention programs that, you know, without the, 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 uh, the causes of their offending behaviour actually being addressed. So that got me thinking, you know, that and the continued volume of prisoner complaints, which was not drying up, are our prisons actually making us safer? Are we getting smarter on crime and punishment? So, in an attempt to answer these questions, I did an investigation last year into rehabilitation and reintegration of prisoners. And I want to just tell you a little bit about what I found. So, we are locking up more people than ever before. We are finding that those people we're locking up are returning to prison at a higher rate than ever before. And thirdly, it's costing us more than ever before. Last year, over $1 billion. Now that kind of says to me that something doesn't add up. You know, these numbers also made clear something that I've no doubt many people in this room have been aware of for a very long time, that my investigation had to look wider than the walls of our prisons for the answers. So in this very brief presentation, I'm only going to be touching on a fraction of this report. You're very welcome to take a look at it online. It actually sold out very quickly, that prisons report. I was told it was a bestseller in prisons. <laughs> um, but uh, what I, I, I will do is just look at some of the factors that, that sat behind that. And, and again, I think they won't be a surprise to, to many of you, and certainly not to, to anybody in this room who's been working in the criminal justice system, because what you will see is that changes to our parole system, we're keeping more people in, in, in prisons, we had an almost doubling of the number of parole orders denied in 2014, and that number is going up again in 2015. Sentencing reforms, uh, baseline sentencing, abolition of suspended sentences, uh, more recently somewhat mitigated by community correction orders. Bail reforms, again another factor you can see here, uh, seeing more people being remanded into custody. Um, and our report quotes 25% of the prison population actually being on remand, which nearly doubled the figure of four years before. So. What are we doing about that? So, you know, more, you know, more people in prisons, higher population, higher recidivism. What has been the response of the system to that? Well, here it is. A massive building program to build more prisons. Ease the overcrowding. But prison is actually the most expensive response we have to criminal behavior. And we can see from the recidivism rate in that last slide, it doesn't appear to be working. So let's just take a look at what's going on in our prisons and uh, who have we got actually locked up? Well, the links between imprisonment and disadvantage are pretty well known and I don't claim as the Ombudsman to have come up with some great uh, original revelation on this subject. But the facts are still very impactful when you look at them in detail. Alcohol and drug abuse, mental health, high rates of unemployment, often a complete lack of engagement with either schooling or work, these are the marks of our prisoners. Just, you know, take an example, looking at the high school completion rate, that's, you know, in, in prisons, 6% of men compared with nearly 90% of the population as a whole. I mean, that's actually a very, very stark and very striking comparison. As the excellent work of Jesuit Social Services tells us, postcode data is also incredibly compelling. You know, the link between disadvantage and imprisonment. Prison, a family affair, sadly as well. The children of prisoners are six times more likely to be imprisoned than their peers. And, and the particular problems of women prisoners, I think also very, very striking and, and, and really very sad highly likely to be victims of abuse themselves. Yeah, so one of the things I asked in the report is, how do you address the problem of recidivism when prison is the place that some people actually feel safest? So that's a, a, a bit of a grim picture about you know, the people inside our prisons. And what's actually being done 
inside prisons to, to address this? Well, actually quite a lot is going on. You know, there are programs available, you know, lots of different types to address offending behaviour. We have drug and alcohol treatment programs, there are educational programs. But what we found in this report, that in all cases, the, the sheer number of prisoners meant that the system is simply struggling to cope with the, the, the weight of that increasing demand. You know, more people in prison, more demand for, for programs, greater demand as a result of the changes to the parole system. And, and that's what we were seeing. So the combination of tightening parole um, has meant huge delays in actually getting access to, to the kind of programs that, that, um, that are available inside. And the impact of that is also rather worrying. Some people actually aren't bothering. Now, this quote, which uh, included in our report, I thought was uh, pretty compelling stuff. This comes from a prison officer. And... Uh, I'll let you read that for yourselves. But uh, as, um, as the prisoners themselves, you know, some of them put it rather colloquially, you can stuff your programs and stuff your parole. It's not worth it, what people were saying. So the impact of that, and I think this should worry us as a community concerned about public safety, is that increasingly prisoners are coming out of prison straight from maximum security facilities at the end of their sentence, so they're not bothering with parole, which means that, you know, come the end of the sentence, you've got, you know, the prison, they have to be released, that's the point, and they haven't done the programs that we as a community have said they need to do, and that surely is not making us safer. So let's just take a look briefly at what happens when people leave the prison gates. And again, another quote that I thought I'd share with you from a community service organisation which I think says it all. They are the bottom of the priority list. And bear in mind that alcohol and drug issues are actually a key driver of recidivism. Access to drug treatment inside prisons and upon release, very limited. Mental health, also a factor. So, you know, this, this was a, for me, quite a powerful quote about why people actually, when they get out of prison, think that it's not a bad idea to go straight back there. The impact of drugs and alcohol, employment. When you're out of prison, actually, you're no longer the, business, you're the, the responsibility of the justice health system. You actually fall back onto the broader public health system. You go into waiting lists, nothing happens. So there's no, there's a complete disconnect between the two. Employment, a really obvious factor. You know, most prisoners were unemployed before they went into prison and their chances are generally not improved by incarceration. And the final quote I just wanted to share with you comes from a female prisoner. And this was a, a really, um, really powerful for me and, 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 uh, and, and, and very, very sad uh, <coughs> quote about the experience of a young woman who was released from prison basically onto the street. And she had nowhere to go when the gates open. It was June. They put you in the clothes you came in with. She'd put on weight so nothing fitted. Got nothing. There's no one here to support me. I had no other option but to tough it out. And that, sadly, is a very, very typical experience of female prisoners upon release. And again, many of them, as I mentioned earlier, victims of, 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 um, of abuse themselves, they haven't got a home to go back to. OK, so what is the solution to all of this? You know, there is actually a bit of good news among all that gloom. We actually have quite a lot of good practice in Victoria already, and as well as international experience to learn from. Um, we just need to do more of it. So we've got a drug court in Dandenong, which has substantially reduced the rate and seriousness of reoffending. I was really pleased to see in the um, in the state in the in the in the budget um, this year that they're adding another 32 million dollars to expand the drug court's operations into the Melbourne Magistrates Court. Uh, Koori courts again, culturally appropriate models. No evaluation since 2006, but you know we 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 you know we, we know they work. Naples Justice Centre again. Why is there only one? And a, and a fantastic place in, 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 in the prison system, the, the transition centre for Judy Lazarus has very low rates of recidivism that has 25 beds, so one place. 
one, you know, 25 people can get access to that compared with the, the hundreds, the thousands that are released every year. Justice reinvestment, again, across the ditch, we know New Zealand actually has quite a bit of success with this. <coughs> we know that, indeed, the, um, that great law and order bastion of Texas uh, has decided that, uh, that, 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 that rather than building more prisons, that there is money to be saved, actually, in diverting people out of the prison system. It's, you know, it's a remarkable revelation. So let me just, just end on, on, on this note, that you don't actually have to reinvent the wheel. We, but what we do need to solve this problem is a whole-of-government approach. Because tackling the, you know, the myriad interwoven issues that have created a prison system that is simply not working, that is costing us an ever-increasing sum, that is sending people back into the community to re-offend, isn't just a prisons issue. It isn't even just a justice issue. It's a public health issue. It's a housing issue, it's, a, it's an education issue, it's an unemployment issue, it's a social issue. It's a problem that affects all of us and we as a community have to actually address it. So the reform in the law, for example, to allow Aboriginal prisoners to retain the proceeds of artworks that they, that they have made in prisons is a very small example that they've got some money to get on with to allow them to support their rehabilitation. And if that reform keeps one prisoner from returning to prison, that's $295,000 saved on an average sentence. And that's $295,000 that could be spent, for example, on increasing um, drug rehabilitation in, in, in rural Victoria to stop people from entering the system in the first place. It, it could be spent on helping those inside find a roof over their heads and worthwhile occupation when they get out. It is actually possible to make the leap from talking prisons into talking justice. And I think, ladies and gentlemen, we need to do it. Let's do it. Thank you very much.